Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Our guest today, Jesse Jackson, has traveled from Boone, North Carolina, where he's on the faculty of Appalachian State University. What do you teach there? I teach uh, children's literature, the technique of writing children's stories, and uh, fill in here and there when they need someone to talk about black history, which has been a favorite of mine for a very long time. Joining me in welcoming you are Helen May Mullen, Assistant Coordinator of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia, and Carolyn Field, Coordinator, my collaborator on the Profiles in Literature series. Let's get to know you first through some of the jobs you've held in your lifetime. Well, job number one was delivering newspapers. And uh, that job introduced me to a lot of people who could uh, help me later on. From, of course, I was going to school during these times, but seemingly looking for a job and holding a job during those lean days was most important. And while I was in high school, I started to write for newspapers. Naturally, I wanted to become a newspaper man. And I wound up for a time uh, after high school uh, editing a black newspaper for the a newspaper a weekly for the uh, black community. And it was a four page affair. We went out into the country and set it up at the end of the week. We sold it on the streets. It's the only way we could get money out of it was our advertising wasn't too great and uh, uh, too flourishing. And uh, from that, I met uh, other people, such as the judge and the court, who asked me to write speeches for him. And uh, I went to the university. I learned to box there, I, probably the only thing at the time that was uh, quite Ohio educational. Ohio State University? Ohio State University, yes. I won a boxing tournament there, and that made me think I could be, make, earn a living doing that, and, which I was quickly discovered I couldn't. In fact, the job of staying on my feet uh, was the most important job at that time during a fight. Uh, my parents objected, but uh, I soon became intelligent enough to stay out of the boxing ring. From there, I went to construction, and, what was it, building streets. Of course, we had to tear them up first. <laughs> and you had to load the torn, but the asphalt on trucks and uh, that helped my muscle. And, oh yes, I went to, I became a lifeguard. And uh, I should have mentioned that I'm very fond of swimming and sports. And I think uh, I was more of a bench warming athlete than really one out earning the letter and so on. Then I became uh, a probation officer, which I always look back upon as a turning point in my life because I discovered a lot of things about my hometown, Columbus, Ohio, that I thought I already knew, but I didn't know the extent of poverty and what poverty does, the way of crime and uh, bringing boys, black boys, into the uh, court where I was a probation officer. I say it was a turning point because I discovered that the inability to read uh, brought kids into crime first one was uh, truancy from school. <laughs> now I ran into that and uh, you have to uh, give me a signal on which path to take because I uh, don't enjoy uh, talking about my work as a probation officer because it was, it was uh, depressing and to see the number what f more did you do that was connected with writing? Did you get to Breadloaf, for example? Well, uh, I began writing stories about some of the uh, cases I handled while I was a probation officer. And uh, I wanted to find out whether these stories were publishable or whether 
it would be worth my while to go to a place like uh, the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. And I took my stories to Professor Francis Utley at Ohio State University. And he said, by all means, go to Bread Loaf. And there I got another boost. Wallace Stegner picked one of my manuscripts out of the hopper and read before the class as one of the um, better, one of the promising manuscripts. And uh, on a suggestion of his, I stopped at Harper and Brother, Harper Brothers, that was the name of it then, later became Harper and Rowe. And there uh, I met a wonderful editor, Ursula Nordstrom, who suggested that I try my hand at writing a children's story. She told me, of course, that uh, beforehand, that she had asked Richard Wright to do such a story. I tried my hand at it, but he was, un he was unable to um, do the story. So I went back to Columbus, Ohio, and began writing what later turned out to be Call Me Charlie. And uh, I must add that Miss Nordstrom was of great help in suggesting and in editing and in cautioning me about the mistakes that I was making during the writing. That without her help, it couldn't have been written. What about McDowell Colony? Did you, I understand you were there too. Yes, I uh, went to McDowell Colony after I had done several books though. And uh, I, I believe I worked on Tessie while I was there. I mean, you have to understand that I was working on nine to five jobs and uh, any uh, period that I could spend right entirely uh, devoting myself to the craft of writing uh, was looked forward to. Now I tell people that I went to McDowell Colony and they look us, they're surprised because so very few people who apply to the colony are accepted. And one of the things uh, I want to mention that you have separate studios at the McDowell Colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And the former occupants of the studio put their name on a little shingle and it stands over the fireplace. And that way I could uh, see some of the outstanding people that I had followed. James Baldwin was at the studio that I had before I came there. Uh, Edwin Arlington Robinson, the uh, great poet who wrote Matthias, was, lived in my studio. I must say that I was there um, three years running. That is a couple of months out of each year like 1966, 67, and 68. And uh, it's a beautiful place. You are inspired by the other writers there and the artists and uh, the tradition of McDowell, the, Mrs. McDowell, the composer's wife, scrounged around and got the money to buy the 400 acres that these 40-some studios are located on. And you work in your little studio, you write and all day and somebody brings you a lunch at midday and it's really a, uh, what should I say, it's cloudy, it's quiet, it's cloud 11 <laughs> along with the beautiful countryside and trees and so on. You mentioned Call Me Charlie. Is your own background more like that of Charlie or like that of Stonewall Jackson, who appears in more recent books, The Sickest Don't Die the Quickest and The Fourteenth Cadillac? I would say it's more uh, like the Stonewall Jackson in The Sickest Don't Always Die the Quickest and in The Fourteenth Cadillac. Uh, the Call Me Charlie, you remember, was published in 1945, light years away. And so, as it was the first introduction of a black who, boy character who has departed from the stereotype um, Penrod and Sam situation, it required um, careful handling him so that I look back on him and say, well, he was the proper black boy. He wore a clean shirt and a tie and wanted to do like Horatia Alger did, work hard and rise by dint of the sweat of the brow. We're going to talk a little bit more about Charlie now. Um, his 
desires for further schooling and for sports career are best reflected not in the first Charlie book, but in the last two of the trilogy, Anchorman and Charlie Starts from Scratch. We're going to give a little special attention to part of the contents of Anchorman, which won an award from the National Council of Christians and Jews in 1947 when it was published. Anchorman takes place in Ohio in the 1940s. Until the burning of a ghetto school, Charlie Moss is the only black student at Arlington High School. He's the smallest member of a four-man relay team which is preparing for a big meet against arch rivals. The track team members own a jalopy called the Chuggalug, which saves them travel time so they can train more. When other black students enter Arlington High, Clarence Duke, a tough ghetto youth, tries out for the track team and impresses everyone with his stamina and speed. But because of his hatred and mistrust of white people that developed from his background and from an unfortunate family experience, he constantly gets into trouble. Let's take a look now at this vignette. Duke is waiting to hear how a student council meeting will affect his future. I've been talking myself hoarse. Trying to get you off easy. Well, how'd the council meeting go? How'd you guys treat me? Boy, I thought it was all over for a while. The principal just about had most of the kids convinced that you really ought to be suspended for 30 days. What? Just because I use the chugger love, that old jalopy is nothing but old hunk anyway. Oh, come on. You know what you did. You took it from the parking lot without asking, drove it around all night, burned out the motor, and left it abandoned on a highway. Now the fool of us have to pay for a new engine. So what? I was trying to get it back to the school parking lot when it conked out on me. I wasn't going to keep it. Anyway, what's the verdict? Well, we got you off as easy as possible with only two weeks out in the doghouse. Two weeks? Oh man, that won't give me any time to train for the next track meet. Hold on, Duke. Can't you see they gave you a break? And you can run on your neighborhood track. Back in the ghetto, the Blackberry Patch. Oh, forget the training. What kills me is that this whole thing could have been dropped if you'd gone and today explained to them that there really wasn't that much this whole chug love business anyway. Who do you think you are? You're nothing but a big baby. You stole a car. You get yourself into trouble, and then when you don't just slide out of it, well, the whole world's wrong. I almost wish I kept my mouth shut during that meeting. How do I know you didn't go in there with your mouth buttoned up, scared to death, scared of saying something that some of your white friends might not like? You've been the only black guy in this lily white school for so long, you don't know what your color is. I can imagine how disappointed you were when the high school in the ghetto burned down when poor folks came here. Cut it! My family's not rich and you know it. Dad's a chauffeur, mom's a housekeeper. I've always worked. I've had a paper route when I was 12. So just cut that poor folk junk. You had a suit to wear to the school dance, didn't you, Mr. Boy Scout? Man, I was just trying to use the chug lug as a taxi that night to pick me up enough fares to buy me a new suit. My suit wasn't new. It was an old one of Dad's made over. You just don't understand. Look at the trouble you've gotten into since you came here. And look at how the other new kids have gotten along. Julie is singing with the school orchestra. And some of the guys are doing great on the baseball team. And, but not you. Only gripes and bitterness from your corner. I know why you're belly aching. I'm better on the relay team than you are, and you're scared stiff. Scared because I just might take your place. <laughs> yeah, I bet you stood up for me in student council, just like a snowman stands up in the sun on the 4th of July. Can't you get it through your head? We need you. We need you on the relay team. We've got to win, and we might with your help. But I'm warning you, that crack about me warning you off the team makes me just about mad enough to run circles around you. Tell you what, 
I'm not gonna give you the chance. I'm quick. I see how it is around here. I'm good enough to run my legs off in relay races, but just another bum when it comes to getting an even break. Here's a farewell tip. You'd be better off sticking with your own kind. Duke, I can't believe you're a quitter. Your brother never quit a fight. If my brother had quit early in the game before that crooked white manager let him burn himself out, he'd be walking around free instead of rotting in prison. He thought white folks were straight, but he found out. Only he found out too late, but I'm finding out in time. Don't you ever get tired of being pushed around? When I was new around here, some guys tried to push me around, but I convinced them to stop right quick, and I haven't had a fight since. <laughs> Gotta leave now, Mr. Ostrich. <laughs> when you get your head up out of the ground, maybe you'll stop sticking up for your white friends and see how they abuse me. Duke, you're doing the same thing you say the whites do, looking at nothing but color. What really counts is whether the guy's on the level or not. And I suppose it's on the level to help them win their race? Yes, it is on the level. It's our race. And if you were the great champion of our people that you pretend to be, you'd run with us. The two of us on the Arlington team at the Ohio Relays? Wow, that would really be something. Something? <laughs> yeah, first you get some praise and boot it in the rear. No, thank you. You can go get your glory alone. It's all yours. Well, so long, sucker. Charlie and his teammates win the Ohio Relays as Duke watches from the stands. Duke is finally convinced that there may be some truth in Charlie's point of view. Mr. Jackson, what were you thinking as you saw that skit? I thought it was excellent, the acting, it made me believe that it was much better than the part in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, interested in the fact that we've been talking about Charlie, but you did write about a girl, uh, Tessie's story, and I wondered, was the character Tessie Downs based on a person or an incident that you'd heard about? Uh, it was from an incident. I heard my wife talking with a friend of ours on the phone. The friend of ours' daughter had been chosen to play the part of a black maid in a play. And the girl's mother was quite upset. She said she didn't, hadn't sent her, school, uh, her daughter to the school to um, dust up room for white students and uh, act as their flunky. And I thought it was an excellent, uh, can be made into an excellent story. Because I felt that any role that a kid got to act, that is any respectable role, should be taken because experience would help, that experience would help the kid <coughs> realize the ambition of being an actor. So I began putting the pro and cons to this. And uh, there was such a flap over a black woman playing the role in Dear Ruth of a maid that uh, if you ever see Dear Ruth, you will see that that role has been taken by a white maid. No argument. Mm -hmm. Was your own daughter a <coughs> student in a school like Hobbs? My daughter attended the same school as a friend of our daughter. But mm -hmm. her uh, experience, her, she did not uh, play, uh, take a part in the play. But her daily account of what happened in the school uh, certainly gave me insight into uh, the job before a black student going to an all-white school where the income was much higher than that of blacks. Uh, not only did the child have to adjust to uh, white students, but they, she had to adjust to the fact that, say, before the spring break, uh, the white parents took their kids off to uh, ski someplace or to the Caribbean. And the uh, poor black's daughter attended the school to come home and well, Daddy, uh, why can't we go to Bermuda? Mm -hmm. And so it's all we can do is keep our heads above the water and, and send you to the school. Here you come face to face with uh, the complex problems of, uh, uh, shall we call it integration racially or integration economically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
It has many, it has many uh, questions that I've often thought of. Well, about. and I think the young people need to read books that will make them think about it and will help them to see the other person's side. Uh, they can't see it just looking at a person, but they can see it reading a book that will involve them emotionally, involve their feelings. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about uh, your work with the editor, because you've mentioned Ursula Nordstrom, who is one of the great old-time editors. There aren't too many of them left today that really uh, worked with individuals, either uh, adult authors or children's authors. And how did Ursula work with you? Did she really uh, help you? Ursula Nordstrom made possible the book. She worked with me chapter by chapter. And you have to remember that this was back in 1945. Right. When, edit, when publishing firms had a larger staff and uh, inflation wasn't burning their britches and profit in areas. And uh, you have to remember that today, uh, editorial staffs have been scaled down to the fewest people possible, and they don't have They, they the really don't edit work. They don't today. work with you. Mm -hmm. even, there are so many processes in book production that have been eliminated. So that, well, I don't want to get into that. The other uh, thing is that Ursula Nordstrom suggested the idea for the story, and I could take it on from there. She wanted a book about the experiences of a black boy growing up in a Middle Western uh, town in, uh, 19, in the late 1940s. Uh, she could sense uh, subjects and mm -hmm. interest, and this was, many people say now, well, Jackson, you wrote that book nine years before the uh, 1954 Supreme, Supreme Court, Court uh, mm -hmm. decision desegregating schools. And uh, how is it you have uh, blacks in there uh, entering a school and desegregating? I said, well, the imagination runs a little bit faster than history. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, uh, there are other things in there that were quite uh, ahead of the time. What? But I mentioned that uh, my mother was the Supreme Court. <laughs> but there were uh, blacks in the schools because uh, I, I went to school mall in Massachusetts where we had blacks in our school. It was, it, they were, it was not segregated at that time, and that's way back before you wrote this book. But aside from that, let's go back to Ursula. Did she help you with uh, developing your characters and developing the plot and moving it along? Did she make suggestions to you? Yes. Uh, she didn't leave you on your own. No, example, uh, Charlie... She pointed out that you have fallen in love with Charlie, and uh, a writer should be like an orchestra leader. You're leaving out some of the uh, scores, you're leaving out the outline of some of your characters, and you've got to distribute the reader's interest. There were other things. She scolded me. It's like a mother, a midwife, on certain phrases that I'd used. She said, you mustn't use a phrase like that. She, so now you're writing for predominantly uh, white public, white readers, and uh, you have to treat everybody in the story objectively, given their character, given the crises. She was extremely helpful. And she wanted you to write in, uh, quote, standard English, unquote, so that's that right, that, any, that's everybody right, could read right. it. I had my own pet phrases I wanted to in, in, uh, include. Well, you use idi idioms in yes, the book, which yes. is perfectly natural. Would, would you tell us any experience that you think would interest uh, viewers concerning your writing of your 1974 book, Make a Joyful Noise Unto the Lord, the life of Mahalia Jackson, Queen of Gospel Singers. Well, uh, put it. Look, let's look at it this way. Prior to 1962, uh, it was very difficult to get a book written on a black subject by a black author. Uh, uh, so, uh, after 1962, after blacks entered a number of schools and libraries, there was naturally a great need for books about blacks by blacks. So if a writer who had had some work published showed up at a cocktail party where there were editors, he could depend on getting offers to write books. Uh, and practically uh, there, was a, there was a rush for such things. 
One uh, party I attended, uh, an editor approached me with a list of names of characters, of people living and dead, which, wanting a biography done of them. And I saw Mahalia Jackson's name on it. I said, that's the one I want to write about. Was it Milton Meltzer, the editor of the series, that asked you? Or was it someone else from the uh, publishing house? It was someone else from someone the publishing house. Someone else, yes. Did you ever have an opportunity to talk to her personally? Yes, I did. You did. I think this comes through. Uh, yeah, I followed her around from concert to concert. She'd long been a favorite of mine. My background, that of uh, attending a Baptist church, listening to the gospel choir on Sunday. There are always you know, two uh, choirs in the right. Baptist church. Uh, the ones who have training in singing and those who have more spirit than training. Right. I think young people reading her biography certainly can be inspired of a woman who had very little uh, motivation or encouragement from anyone and who managed to make a, a very happy life for herself and for millions of people. Um, I was interested in your uh, introduction for young children to blacks in America from a historical point of view, and I wondered where you did your research for that. Well, I began research for my Black in America, A Fight for Freedom, when my mother first bought me books about blacks from door-to-door -door peddlers. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, uh, that was a common thing. In a black neighborhood, you'd see book salesmen going from door-to-door, -door selling books for 50 cents a week. Mm -hmm. It never did tell you how much it would cost in the end. But I remember my mother buying a book called Famous Blacks in American History. Christmas Addicts and uh, uh, Du Bois, uh, Robert Ad Abbott, uh, the for founder and editor of the Chicago Defender. And it always puzzled me that these books uh, were published, but you never found them at the school library or at the public library. And so I, uh, after hearing Carter G. Woodson, famous black historian lecture in the black neighborhood. That's the only place he could lecture at that time. I began reading the Journal of Negro History. And in that, I came across things of the recruiting list of soldiers from Virginia and the Revolutionary War, and just kept on. So this, my interest in my uh, black in America is an accumulation of stories and articles that I've written. My mother told me many stories. My mother told me the story. Uh, my mother, my great grandmother, was uh, a slave on Henry Clay's plantation in Lexington. Oh. And uh, when I was four or five years old, my mother would tell me about how my great uncle Reuben was sold into slavery. Oh. It's a dramatic story about my great grandmother's uh, son, Reuben Todd was sold by Henry Clay's overseer because he was unruly. So all these things I tried, I, I promised myself as a very young person that the one story that I wanted to write about was Uncle Reuben. I've never been able to get together. I'm going I through correspondence with yeah. the Kentucky Historical Society mm -hmm. to get the names of Henry Clay's uh, slaves, the one he paid tax on. Please stop me. I can just go on. <laughs> this is too exciting, but I'm sorry. Yes. The clock is our enemy. Thank you very much. For over 30 years, Jesse Jackson has had his books published, beginning with Call Me Charlie, which was honored by the Child Study Association. It was written as a small tribute to the good people who somehow or other succeed in making bad things better. Mr. Jackson has written nine books and has contributed to Crisis Magazine of the NAACP. In 1975, he won the Carter G. Woodson Award. That name has special meaning for you, of the National Council of Teachers of Social Studies. It's been a great pleasure having you as our guest. <laughs>